All right, so this sort of particular passion started about last um, spring. I was back in my hometown. I'm from Lancashire in the north of England. Um, my friend and I went for a walk um, in the woods, sort of uh, slightly altered, so my internal chatter was relatively minimal. And my friend and I were, were sharing stories and ideas, but I kept seeing these little phrases that weren't quite in my own voice. You know, when you've been sort of picking up mannerisms or accents from someone else. Um, it, it was a bit like that, not like I was quoting anything, it was just sort of happening. I was just suddenly had all this sensible advice to give. And at the time I was reading a book by this incredible woman called um, Laura Huxley. Um, some of you might have heard of her husband. And it's called You Are Not the Target, a practical manual of how to cope with a world of bewildering change. And it's a self-help book that was published in 1962. And I was reading this for research um, more than anything, ju just for context, I'm in the middle of a um, PhD thesis centered on psychedelics and language and perception. And a lot of that focuses on Aldous Huxley's life after the doors of perception. Um, so I was preparing to go on this research trip to California. There's this huge archive at UCLA full of the Huxley's manuscripts and correspondence. So I was just sort of speed reading a load of the things that were in Huxley's orbit at the time. But this one book, um, You Are Not the Target, it was really catchy, it really stuck. So I go off to California to this archive, um, and it's my first day there. I get, I get to the campus, and it was spring break, so huge sections of, of this campus were cordoned off for this movie shoot. I try to sort of figure out how to get to this building. Um, and basically, we had to wait until the, the scene had been shot before we could pass through, and there, there was a little group of us. And I get talking to this little elderly woman about what I'm doing there, and how oh, you know Huxley Psychedelic Renaissance. She's like, oh, wow, yeah, my husband and I actually met at this talk that Krishnamurti gave at, at Berkeley. Yeah, yeah, we were a little too young to know Aldous, but we met his wife, Laura, a bunch of times. I was like, whoa, that's really synchronous, just the first person I've met on this campus. How interesting. Um, and it really set the tone for the trip. I've sort of gone there for Aldous, Aldous Huxley and, and came back with his wife, um, and I became totally immersed in this woman's world, but not, not really as a fan or a reader. It was more like I'd made a friend. You know, she was making cameos in my dreams and just became this huge fountain of inspiration. Um, and that's really, really what I want to do here, just to share a little bit of her story and, and her energy with you. Um, so this, will t this talk, it'll be a blend of sort of some of her wisdom wholesale, but, but also where her ideas have sort of taken me in my own research. Um, I feel as though hers is a bit of a lost history, you know, she's quite famous for her relationship with Aldous, but actually she made some wonderful contributions of her own to ideas around psychedelics and integration and, and education. Um, and this book, You Are Not the Target, it became a bestseller um, in the early 60s. It outsold anything that Aldous Huxley had written for a long time. Um, and actually, it, um, it was meant to be republished as a dual collection with um, Leary Ralph um, Metzner um, and Alpert's The Psychedelic Experience for sort of financial reasons. It didn't, it didn't end up happening, which I think is a shame because I suspect if it had, it would have made the sort of psychedelic canon in a much more visible way. But... Either way, for me, what really stands out about Laura is that she's a different and very accessible voice in a scene that's really dominated by male intellectuals. And actually, she's one of the first psychotherapists using LSD. Um, and for me, it just still has a lot to offer in terms of um, this integration concept. And we're always talking about integration. You know, what are we bringing back from these experiences? And I think that one of the main obstacles here is language. Now, that said, I don't really buy into this whole ineffability narrative, or, or I do, but only to the degree to which every subjective experience is somewhat ineffable, beyond words. And also, this, this ineffability, it's, um, it's, much more of a Western, it's much more of a Western thing. You know, indigenous, indigenous groups with long plant medicine histories aren't stunned into silence by ayahuasca journeys. Rather, they have an intricate mapping and taxonomy of the spirit realm and, and complex mythologies to support their traditions. 
So, you know, on the one hand, I think a lack of tradition means that we don't have a good semantic toolkit. But I think even more pressing is, is that most of the time we don't even realise what's implicit in the language that we are using. I mean, we, we speak and we, we think and we even perceive through metaphors um, and we barely notice that we're doing it. So, you know, we're all taught in school um, how to use metaphors and creative writing and, and it's the key to a vivid description and that's how you get an A in your GCSEs or, or whatever uh, examination system you're in. But metaphors aren't just lively descriptions, they're, they're deeply rooted in our experience of the world. Um, I won't go into this in, in sort of huge detail, but um, there's a really famous book by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson called Metaphors We Live By that really set this research in, in motion. Um, and it sort of walks you through this idea that there are um, sort of certain metaphors that are so integral um, to the way that we think and perceive reality that we don't even notice. Um, we don't even notice that they're metaphors. And he calls them basic metaphors. And a basic metaphor would be something like life as a journey. So then when we use everyday phrases, um, so if we, say, we say things like, oh, you know, I'm on a different path now, or, um, oh, that injury was a setback, or even things like, oh, I've always been really rubbish at poaching eggs, but I'm getting there. All these follow the, the structure of this larger conceptual metaphor that life is a journey, that we're going somewhere. Um, and for me, at least, it's hard to really imagine thinking about many things in my life without that structure. But that's not an ontological constituent of reality. It's, it's, it's part of our storytelling faculty. It's the way we experience time in this, in, this linear, in this linear way and how we just make sense of our existence. Now, Laura was really, really dialed into these fine nuances of language, these linguistic habits that we take for granted. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of her ideas in a minute and, and where, this, where this leads, but first I just want to share a little bit more of a character and get to know her a little bit better. Um, so, Laura wasn't an intellectual. She never claimed to be a philosopher. She wrote multiple books and never even claimed to be a writer. Um, she, she sort of says in one interview that she didn't especially like reading despite this tremendous curiosity and openness to the world. And she was from Turin, Italy. And she was a professional violinist until she was 26. Um, a bit of a prodigy, really. Her first concert, I think, was for the Queen of Italy. Um, she went on to study under various famous composers in Paris and Berlin. But um, the story is that at 26, she put the violin away and said she wasn't going to play anymore, that she'd had this excruciatingly rigorous musical training as a teenager. And, and, and she felt that it had kept her prisoner. Um, so she was living in California by this point, and uh, she did a load of things after she uh, retired from music. She was editing documentaries, um, breeding poodles. <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> I can't confirm that, but the point is she was a really fiercely independent spirit. So how did she wind up in psychedelic therapy? Well, she was best friends um, for a long time with this woman called Ginny Pfeiffer who was actually Ernest Hemingway's sister-in-law. And in the late 1940s, Ginny was uh, diagnosed with cancer and told she could live, uh, she could expect to live another year, you know, two if she was really lucky. So basically, this, this sent Laura on a quest to explore any and every alternative medicine she could find. And she'd do them alongside Ginny, whether it was a diet of only grapes or rituals or hypnosis. Um, and she'd do them, yeah, she'd do them with Ginny. Um, and Ginny lived. She lived to a ripe old age, had a, had a daughter. They'd um, sort of tried so many things that they weren't really sure what had worked or whether it was just the pure belief it was going to work. But that's what set Laura on this, on this creative therapy path. So she retrained and she was working as a psychotherapist and a hypnotherapist when she and Aldous got together in 1955. Um, so, which was just when he was really getting involved with these medicines. So through that circle, she got involved with these medicines and, and learned about how to incorporate these tools into her practice. You know, no, she wasn't attached to, a, to an academic institution publishing psychiatric papers, 
but she was certainly a pioneer in this practice and it was really interesting to go to the archives and look at some of the correspondence from that time. You know, there's people like Humphrey Osmond and Albert Hoffman writing to Laura for advice. You know, Humphrey Osmond was using some of her techniques in his alcohol addiction therapy. Um, Mike Murphy, the founder of Esalen, was referring people to her uh, for treatment. She was really, really revered in these circles. Um, and as you can imagine, she was a real central influence in Aldous Huxley's thinking too. Because you know, for all the merits of for all the merits of the doors of perception, it's really just a sort of lively a lively reiteration of a lot of the religious texts that he'd already been reading. Um, and also, I mean it was it was his first experience, and it's important to remember that he'd had one psychedelic experience at that time. And he only realized later that actually these experiences are progressive and that we can learn different things from different contexts, but it really wasn't that obvious at the time. Um, and what Huxley realized was that his famous day with mescaline had been too focused inwards, that had been too concerned with his own sort of beatific vision, and, and that the big question is, well, well then what? Um, he wrote he wrote this to Humphrey Osmond after a subsequent experience where he says, I was this fact, or, or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that this fact occupied the place where I'd been. The result was that I did not, as in the first experience, feel cut off from the human world. I was intensely aware of it, and all of the things which had entirely filled my attention on that first occasion, I now perceive to be temptations. So, he turned his attention outwards to look at what practices we might use to um, sort of in incorporate these insights into new behavioral paradigms, which um, became Island, his attempt to synthesize it. How many people have read Island? A few people. Okay. Um, <laughs> so he felt that it was the most important work of his life, but it, it wasn't critically received that well. It's a sort of vision of utopia. He creates this very sane society on the island of Parla, but the problem is with writing about quite a sane society is that it's not very interesting l in, from a literary perspective. Um, but it's funny because one element of the book that's quite ubiquitously praised is his schooling system um, in the community. <laughs> what I realized exploring Laura, that basically everything in that section is her. You know, all of his good ideas, his techniques about controlling your temper and redirecting your energy and, and different types of self-talk. It, it's all Laura. And it makes an awful lot of sense, actually, because well, Aldous Huxley was this gentle, highly intelligent, upper-class English intellectual. Um, you know, he had an encyclopedic knowledge of a massive array of topics. So from one perspective, yeah, he was the ideal person to, to attempt this utopian blueprint. But one of the problems with Aldous, if you can call it that, was his unrelenting sanity. Aldous Huxley just simply wasn't neurotic. Um, it's a bit annoying, actually. <laughs> so for all his merits, of which there are many, he just wasn't really the best person to be exploring the day-to-day -day implications of these medicines. Um, whereas Laura is this sort of normal neurotic individual. In her own words, she's just not zenish, and she was happy to admit that she's rubbish at seated meditation, though she had a lifelong yoga practice. But she's, like I say, she's a much better person to, to be looking at how this can help us um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what a book is about. You are not the target. And just to share the tools and practices that she'd found useful in her, in her life and therapy and, and working with these substances. Now, one of the things I really actually like about this book is that it doesn't explicitly talk about psychedelics. Um, and bear in mind, this was popular with a sort of 1960s housewife audience, and, and it sort of reads that way, sort of, oh, you might want to try this practice whilst your husband's at, at, at work. It was, mm -hmm. it, 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 the, the, so there are elements that haven't aged that well, but, but it, it sort of showed why it worked for a more mass, for a more mass audience. Um, uh, I'll just mention a little bit more about it because honestly of all the books I've read about altered states, this is really the one that's stuck the most, sort of implanted itself and, and really flourished. Um, 
So the title, first of all, you are not the target. So basically, we can't avoid exposure to negative emotions, but we can avoid this feeling of being the target. You know, we wouldn't typically consider ourselves the target of a hurricane unless we live in a totally solipsistic universe. But and our, and our interactions, they're always part of a complex web of, of other interactions. So, you know, when the shopkeeper's rude to you or the man or woman you adore seems to shut you off or your parents are snappy with you, you know, that's not an isolated encounter. And the chances are that you're not really the target of that negativity. You just happen to be there. So Laura starts the book by explaining that emotions have the power to change body chemistry. Again, incredibly obvious now, um, though, again, less so in the 1960s. We know what stress does to the body with heart disease, insomnia, and blood pressure, etc., and that the mind and the body are so connected because they're not really separate. But she also stresses this idea that the energy that activates our emotions is a neutral force. So in this system, we don't really get bad energy coming in, you know, because we're active participants in our interactions. Um, you know, we don't just passively receive energy from an outside world. It's this idea that our world sort of manifests in our interaction with it. But also, she doesn't ask us to take this as truth. It's more like she asks us to, to try this out as a conceptual device. And these recipes go through different methods of transforming this neutral energy, really, that, that fuels our anxieties and our neuroses and our anger. Some of these are physical practices. Some are about visualization. But a lot of them are centered on language. You know, as a hypnotherapist, she really understood the combined power of suggestion and the imagination, you know, the, the energetic force of words. Um, so this really got me thinking um, more about words, words and metaphors that change our experiences. So, you know, our lives are largely built out of our imaginations. Reality is what we, largely what we narrate to ourselves. And so the, the language and the metaphors that frame this, they radically influence what we pay attention to and, and how we experience the world. Um, I had an experience recently, actually, where um, a few of us had, had, had got hold of these rather sort of colourful chocolates, mm -hmm. and they were really magical, an absolute gift from the gods, but they tasted <coughs> revolting. Um, and initially, it was a sort of nebulous revolting, um, you know, sort of abstractly awful. Most of us in the group hadn't had these particular chocolates before. And one of the guys in the group commented, like, oh, these taste like stomach bile. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, there's this linguistic hook, you know. So then, and the experience was sort of close enough to stomach bile that with that, let's call it a semantic magnet, all that past experience comes sort of rushing into the, into the present. You know, what had been sort of abstractly horrible just became a, a totally different, very acute experience. But, you know, this is going on all the time. Um, with our senses, but, but also with our emotions. Um, and the <coughs> eternal wisdom of Douglas Adams, which I got this quote off, Will. Um, it's, of course, perfectly natural to assume that everyone else is having a far more exciting time than you. Human beings, for instance, have a phrase that describes this phenomenon. The other man's grass is always greener. The Sheltonac race of Brute Kidry and 13 had a similar phrase, but since their planet is somewhat eccentric, botanically speaking, the best they could manage was, the other Sheltonac's dupleberry shrub is always a more mauvey shade of pinky russet. And so the expression soon fell into disuse, and the Sheltonacs had little option but to become terribly happy and contented with their lot, much to the surprise of everyone else in the galaxy who had not realised that the best way not to be unhappy is not to have a word for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's whimsical, but there's certainly some poetic truth here, at, at least. And it, it got me thinking a lot more about language and attention um, and beyond the individual experience as well and, and into the sort of, onto the cultural level. Um, there's, a, there's a famous study, actually, that asked a group of North Americans and a group of uh, Chinese students to describe the same image. Um, not this image, this is irrelevant. Um, and the Chinese students were a lot more dialed into the, the background, whereas the American students were much more likely to describe the objects in, in the foreground. You know, there are all kinds of implications and 
conclusions we can draw here, but, but at its most basic, it shows just how much of perception is participation. You know, we bring so much luggage and decoration with our cultures and our languages. So then in terms of psychedelic experiences, I think our metaphors and the conceptual structures that we carry are incredibly important, you know, especially around the ideas of minds and brains, you know, these big philosophical questions. Um, so imagine everyone here is familiar with the, with the brain as a filter metaphor, um, famously attributed to Henri Bergson. Um, Huxley popularized it, it's poetically present in William Blake, you know, if the doors of perception were cleansed, uh, everything would appear to, etc. Um, and this filter metaphor has really endured in psychedelic research circles, and, and you know, if anyone's taken psychedelics here, it's quite convincing, which is great. However, so much of, at least the English language, is so tied up in a different basic metaphor, which is that the mind is a container. Um, so, you know, we say things like, oh, she's full of ideas, or, oh, his name just escaped me, or even sort of empty your mind and, and breathe. Um, you know, in an abstract way, our, our language is very prone to talking about ideas and feelings as, as objects and ourselves as a sort of receptacle, which isn't obviously compatible with the sort of big mind cosmic consciousness filter metaphor. But of course, it's so deeply woven into our everyday language that, again, it's quite difficult to imagine conversations without it. And, and I'm not even saying that we need to get rid of these habits, just that we should notice them. No, because the problem is that most of the time we don't know we're doing it. You sort of run into someone at the conference and you don't introduce your friend and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry, his name escaped me and I was really embarrassed. It's, it, it's this same structure, sort of name as an object and, and escaped. But when this happens, you're not thinking about how there's actually a metaphysical position that underlies that. Um, so... Back to Laura. So, um, Laura spent a lot of time exploring a version of this in a slightly different um, context. So, another one of our common conceptual metaphors is the idea of states as locations. So, we might talk about, so, I mean, the clues in the name are sort of a state of anxiety, or how uh, he's coming out of a depression, or even sort of find your happy place. It's Again, common phrase is totally automatic, but, but in each, each case, it's sort of a consistent entity in an emotional landscape. Now, part of Laura's therapeutic method was to enco encourage people to try different um, metaphorical structures, and, and this one's really stuck with me. So now, r rather than thinking of myself in an anxious state, um, I sort of think of a, a neutral ocean and lots of different Rianne's who are sailing a ship. You know, there's the calm Rianne, there's the courageous Rianne, there's the anxious Rianne. There were loads of us. So now in these, in these moments of neuroses, it's just that anxious Rianne happens to be steering the ship. And it's a small narrative shift, but you know, let's move neurotic or anxious Rianne off the helm. It, it, it's a lot more empowering. It feels a lot more transitory than, than me trying to navigate out of this, this anxious um, landscape. And I found that um, psychedelic experiences have been a really good way of, of embedding these, these alternative structures and I, I can switch between them quite easily now between this one and the, and the sort of classical um, states one. So just to sort of wrap it up, um, Laura's been really tending the fire beneath these ideas um, you know, around how altered states can reveal and, and help us to integrate different uh, structural metaphors for experience. Um, and that part of this ineffability is simply that I think a lot of our unexamined basic metaphors are inherently materialist, that they're incompatible um, with the experiences that we're having. Um, but just putting sort of that to the side for a moment, what I also realized is that the power of this book wasn't really in what she was saying, but how she was saying it, it's, it's written so simply, it's almost like a, like a children's book. Um, and we really have to think about how we translate our ideas and advice about altered states and integration. Um, I was at the Beyond Psychedelics conference um, last summer in Prague, and a few of us had this, this sudden realization that 
you know, with these wonderful clinical trials, we're, we're not really discovering new information per se. Humans have known about plant medicines and, and um, altered states and healing for, for thousands of years in some cases, but what we're doing, we're translating the information into a, a metaphor that fits Western science, which speaks in graphs and fMRI scans. Um, and it got me thinking about some of the figures in, in Western psychedelic history that we canonize and, and look, at, look up to as well. People like <coughs> Huxley and, and Terence McKenna, they're brilliant thinkers and they're brilliant communicators if you're an educated reader and you're interested in philosophy and, and cultural studies, but not everybody is. And I think it's really easy to forget that in the sort of echo chamber of um, um, the psychedelic research community. Most of us here are pretty educated readers, but, but when I talk to my family and many of the people that I grew up with, I, I can't talk about psychedelics dissolving cultural paradigms or <laughs> structural metaphors. It just doesn't mean anything. Um, you know, even the word philosophy to some people, it, it's quite alienating. And it's not, it's not about a lack of intelligence either, it's, it's a language issue. Um, not to say that we don't need this nuance and complexity, just that we need this range. Um, and also alongside that, pay attention to these metaphors that we take for granted and not to abandon them, but notice what modes of perception are, our metaphors are and aren't suited to. Um, of course, so many elements of, of Buddhist philosophy um, center around this, this no self and this perpetual perishing. And, you know, we, we might read about that and have glimpses of it with psychedelic experiences, but, but we, we come back and we're still, we're still talking in these structures, the structures of life as a journey or the mind as a, a container without probably noticing that we're doing it. Again, though, I really think it's fine that there are incompatibilities here because there are different ways of attending to the world that require different metaphorical systems. Um, you know, paradox shouldn't be seen as a problem. Um, I think the first step is really to sort of tune in, so to speak, um, to what's implicit in our everyday speech, because I think that sometimes we're saying ineffable when we really mean incompatible, um, and that more sort of linguistic awareness and more metaphorical flexibility you know, can serve us, serve us really well. Um, I'll leave it there, but thank you. Thank you.